That's the same ratio as wavelengths would have? No. Well, let's no, take our time. In there. So let's figure out the ratio of the momentums. So, so we have the ratio of the masses is 56 forward. What would be the ratio of the momentums then? Should I actually put two. We don't want. Uh, we don't have to actually crank out all the math here, so we can use some shortcuts. We can see here that. Um, so first of all, are momentum and mass directly related or inversely related? Directly. Yeah, but uh, they're not related. Um, they're not directly proportional. Instead, the momentum is proportional to the square root yeah. of the mass. So if we know the ratio of the masses, the ratio of the momentum should be the square root of that. Yeah. It's just a, a trick in math that helps us to avoid doing all the algebra here. So let's just take the square root of 56. Would I be taking the square root of, of the top and the bottom? Like I know one is one. Right. Yeah, one. you would. Well, what you would probably do is first is turn this into a decimal. Uh -huh. This was 56 over 3. And you would turn it into a decimal by doing 56 divided by 3. And then you would take the square root. approximately 7.5. Even though this is 56 times as massive, it's only about 7.5 times as much momentum because the mass is only related to the square root. Notice that it, if we hadn't done this algebra here, it would be pretty hard to do this. So this was actually a pretty important algebra to actually solve this part of the problem. We yeah, have to know how to simplify this. All that problem, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so that tells us the ratio of the momentums. And now we need to know the ratio of the wavelengths. Well, what was the question asking? What's the ratio of the wavelengths? Yeah, what's the ratio of the wavelengths? Okay. Um, now, are the, uh, so here's the ratio of the momentum. How can we find the ratio of the wavelengths? So inversely related. Yeah. The momentum is inversely related to this. So just flip it? Yeah. Seven, That's right. The ratio of the wavelengths should be the reciprocal of the ratio of the momenta because there's a reciprocal relationship between wavelength and momentum. That you, you could work this out in full by just actually doing all the substitutions algebraically, but that would be very messy and take a long time. It's important to know about these shortcuts. Okay, so let's do that. So like 1.13. 1 0.1333, good. Uh, maybe uh, it would be better to say what the ratio of the hydrogen is to the iron. 7.5. Yeah, that came out as a nice even number, didn't it? That's uh, 15 to 2, or 7.5. 7.5 is good enough. What does this mean? It means that the wavelength of hydrogen is 7.5 times bigger than the wavelength of iron. Why does this have the bigger wavelength? So who has more wave characteristics? Um, hydrogen. Because it has less mass. Remember we've been seeing, remember that um, we don't even notice the wave characteristics of ordinary objects because their masses are too big. It's only when we have very small masses at the subatomic level that you'd even have a wavelength that you would notice. But even down there, hydrogen has more wave characteristics than the iron because it's got less mass uh, if we're holding the kinetic energies constant here. Um, okay, so um, that would give us this, so I guess, all right, so uh, we went over a lot of uh, math tricks here that you might want to review. Uh, simplification, but also, how to take the ratio of things without actually doing all the algebra. So all we did here is we said, gee, the momentum is related to the square root of the mass. So the ratio of the momenta should be the square root of the ratio of the masses. And then we said, gee, the wavelength is the reciprocal, is related to the reciprocal of the, the momentum. So the ratio of the wavelengths should be the reciprocal of the ratio of the momentum. And that way we didn't actually have to plug in for all the k's and h's, uh, which would have been a mess and taking a long time. Yeah. OK, so uh, this is a pretty typical example of how to uh, work with this. Have we answered that part? Yeah. What's the ratio? And as part of your explanation, you might want to explain this has the bigger wavelength because it's less massive, which is what we normally expect in wave-particle duality. Things with smaller masses tend to have more important wave characteristics.
A couple important things to point out here. Notice how this is a multi-part problem where you're supposed to use your previous parts to answer the new part. Yeah. He's kind of giving you clues. So you got to watch for that on your instructor's exams too. Very often you're supposed to use each part as a clue for the next one. First he said, find this equation. Then he said, find this equation. And then the, last, the next part was basically using these two to answer it. So he's actually giving us clues. Also, remember we're supposed to use the variables we were given. What was the variable he gave us for kinetic energy? So this probably might not be a full credit answer. We should be using the same variable he gave us for kinetic energy. That kind of reinforces what I said before, that oftentimes when people say energy, they just mean kinetic energy uh, when they're talking about these particles here. So they might use E instead of K for the energy. OK. Um, well, it's nice confusing because with E, you're thinking of that yeah. flow chart. That's right. So again, this is not, uh, we're, we're not in that flow chart. So then um, atoms are passed through salt spit, which type will make a pattern, so the hydrogen because it has more weight Good. Yeah, that's a really nice twist there at the end because that ties this into our interference and diffraction ideas. Uh, okay. Yeah, the more your wave characteristics are, the more important your, uh, your diffraction pattern will be. Do you remember what the formula was for the diffraction pattern? Here was kind of the, the formula for the bright spots. Yeah. Well, you can see that the bigger lambda is, the bigger the thetas are going to be. And that means there's going to be more separation. So that actually might, for full credit, you might have to use this equation as part of your answer. Um, in fact, um, th so yeah, so we could use this and we could say um, because the hydrogen has the greater wavelength, it'll have bigger thetas, and that means that the sp its spots are more spread out because theta is the angles, basically, that the spots are making. So we know that it will have the, uh, the wider uh, diffraction pattern. In fact, diffraction is one way that people use to actually measure the wavelengths of light. Because, of course, if you just look at light, you can't see what this wavelength is. You might wonder, where are we getting all these wavelengths of light? Um, in fact, I think historically, this is the way that... Um, so historically, uh, we talked about how there was this big, long argument about whether light was a wave or a particle. Uh, and Newton thought it was particles. Everyone liked Newton, so everyone believed him. Uh, but then around 1800, uh, Young did the double slit experiment. Young did the experiment with the two slits, and he noticed this diffraction pattern. Uh, and then that kind of proved that light must be a wave. Now we know it has both wave and particle, but that proved it must have important wave characteristics. And he was actually then able to use that, since he could, he could come up with this equation, he could actually, this was the first time that actually people could figure out, oh, red light has a wavelength of 700, and violet light has a wavelength of 400, because Young could just measure what the thetas were, and he could measure what his d was, and if he measured the d and the theta, he could crank out what, they, what the wavelengths were. So I think until, the, until he did that experiment, so in that experiment, not only did he prove that light was a wave, he actually figured out what the wavelengths were of the visible light because he came up with this equation. Okay, so uh, that's that. All right, so this is a good problem that ties together what we had from the last midterm with uh, this new material here about the wavelengths. And this is the same point I was making before. Earlier, when we, when we were studying for the last midterm, we just saw how light has interference and diffraction patterns. But now we're seeing that atoms and electrons will also have interference and diffraction patterns because they also are small enough to have significant wavelengths as long as the slit is small. Okay. All right, so that's a good question. Um, so hopefully that's one you have in your notes and would go through again. Um, this is from a different instructor, but I think this is pretty typical of the questions that you're likely to see uh, looking at the concepts. And this is more practice with the flowchart. Here in the flowchart, we just went between these two concepts. So the key thing is momentum and kinetic energy are linked by V. That was the key idea for the math for this problem.